Information and Hayek Part 2. In this video, which is a continuation of my series Critiquing Hayek, I'm going to be looking at the way information is lost in the market, contra to his claims. Now, he claims, or claimed back in the 40s and 50s, that the market was an efficient telecommunication system for transmitting information. I intend to demonstrate, firstly, that it's a very lossy information channel, very lossy indeed, and markedly inferior to pre-computing economic interactions via a plan. So let's look at how much information actually exists in prices. If you go to a supermarket, you'll see that typically prices are only given to two or three digits accuracy. And in fact, even that is misleading. If you go and look at Tesco prices, they round them to 25 pence. So there's barely even two digits of accuracy in those. There's no doubt they can easily be encoded with eight bits of binary precision provided that you use some floating point format. Um, for instance, the binary float 16 format, which is widely used in graphics and AI, enables you to represent all the range of prices you're ever going to want, up to the accuracy that you're ever going to want. Because as I say, prices are only given to, to one or two percent accuracy anyway. Now, the second thing is to say, how many products are there in an economy? They've all got prices, and that tells you how much you, information you need to represent each price. But how many products are there? Well, Alibaba apparently has 200 million products on its lists, and Amazon 600 million products. But there's a lot of duplication here, because both of those firms have independent sellers selling the same thing through their website. Amazon only has 12 million of its own products. So these 200 million, 600 million are certainly an overestimate of the number of distinct products. I'm going to say 100 million as an upper bound in a developed industrial economy like China or the US. And I think that is probably an overestimate. We can do a sanity check. We know that the workforce in China is about 900 million. We also know that each distinct industrial product requires several people to make it. And there's lots of people doing the same job. So... 100 million is the right order of magnitude. If anything, that is too high. But let's let's leave it at 100 million. It's interesting that Nove claimed 10 million in the 1960s for the Soviet economy. So Chinese economy is much bigger than the Soviet economy. Now, how much information is that in total? 100 million products sounds like a lot. But if you... If you can encode each price in a 16-bit number, the total information in the prices would be a couple hundred megabytes. And that is trivial by modern standards. It's like what an SD card 25 years ago would have held. Not much. But is this enough to run an economy? Well, it's not really enough. So we have to ask, how much extra information do you actually need to encode the structure of an economy, the structure of the production flows and interactions within an economy? Well, as a certain Chinese leader said, knowledge comes from practice. And how to encode this information wasn't really addressed practically until socialist planning began.
became a real issue in the 1920s. And the person who did the pioneering work on it was a Russian economist, Leontiev. He was a Menshevik, so at the end of the 20s he left the USSR, even though he'd been prior to that working on planning for the USSR. And he moved to the USA and started replicating his work that he'd done on the Soviet economy, on the US economy. And he developed a structural model of the US economy. And his work had long-lasting influence on economics. As a side issue, it had a long-lasting influence on computing as well, because he hired as his PhD student, Kenneth Iverson. And Iverson later went on to develop the programming language APL. Prior to that, he invented a mathematical notation called Iverson's Notation. And this APL language was then used by IBM to design their first range of mainframe computers, unified range of mainframe computers, the IBM 360 series. Uh, and it also was the first programming language available on the first IBM PCs. Now, why did it have this computing impact? It's because Leontiev used a matrix representation for the economy. He had what he called an input-output table. Each industry has both a row and a column. Now, if we look at the green line, this would be a row for a given industry, and as you read across that, it would say where the outputs of that industry were being used elsewhere in the economy. And if the red line would correspond to the um, industry itself, and it would say what did that industry use up in order to produce its final product. And if you look at a given position x, y in that table, it says how much of output y was used in industry x. So this is a tabular representation which encodes the feedback relationships which exist within an economy. Now this is a very important point, that he is encoding the recursive feedback features of an economy. How much data is there? Well, obviously, if you have n products, then the matrix must contain n squared cells. So for the Chinese economy, there would be about 10 to the 16 cells. And that's tens of petabytes. Now, tens of petabytes is just feasible the largest server clusters that people like Google have would be able to hold that. But it is a very large quantity of data. Now, actually, you can economize on this since it turns out many of the cells in a really big table are zeros. Um, I and my students have done estimates of this and by looking at I.O. tables of different sizes, we reckon that the number of non-zero elements is roughly of order n log n, not n squared, which is a lot better than n squared, but still obviously much greater than n. So for the Chinese economy, we'd be talking of the order of tens of gigabytes for an n by n sparse matrix. Now, why is this, why is it important that it's more than n? It's because prices only encode the information about n items, not n squared or n log n items. So this is stating the obvious. Not obvious to the Hayekians because they don't bother reading people like Leontiev. You can't encode an n by n matrix with a vector of only n numbers, even if it's a sparse matrix. You cannot record the economy's state just in the price structure, since the price structure is an order n matrix. So the price form is inadequate 
on information theoretic grounds for its claimed purpose or the purpose claimed for it by Hayek. Price can't capture the n-squared structure of the economy. It can, however, represent something of dimension n. For example, the labour required directly or indirectly to make something, which is what Marx taught. It can do this since the labour content of n types of commodities is also a vector of length n. And a chain, this means that it's adequate for what Marx said, it's not adequate for what Hayek said. Now, why is this information loss important? It's because a change in final price hides its cause. It could be due to a technical change in any one of the many inputs used in that industry. And therefore, current price levels give, can give misleading signals. But planners with access to an I.O. table can directly compute what should be done. They can directly compute what the correct valuations of things are. I'm going to give an example of this with a very simple I.O. table, a five product I.O. table. And I'm going to first show it's easy for planners to use this to compute labour values. I'll then simulate the effect of random change because Hayek emphasises the economy is constantly undergoing change. OK, let's have a random change to the technical coefficients. A random change which might be brought out about by um, the weather, might be brought about, as we know with COVID, by illness affecting the labour inputs, could be affected by changes in technology. We, I'll show how you can compute the change in value that results, and I'll then estimate what a market economy would do, what prices would do on parsimonious assumptions. And I will show that as a consequence of this information loss between an n-squared structure and a vector of n prices, initial price changes are likely to be misleading. So here is the simple economy. I have, to give it a semblance of realism, I have based the physical flows in tons on what's plausible for an economy like the UK. Certainly for the agricultural sector, it's, re it's reasonable for the corn production. And the employment is reasonable. So what we have are corn is measured in tons, flour in tons, final food I'm saying is in loaves of bread, uh, fuel is in tons, manufacturers in tons, and labour in person years. So if we look at this top left corner, it says 280,000 tons of seed were used in the agricultural sector to produce an output of 14, mil 14 million tons, roughly. And 1,800,000 tons of fuel were used, etc. So, as I say, each of these squares indicates something. Now, we can see a feed-forward relationship. Corn is used to make flour. Flour is used to make final food, which is then consumed. Fuel is used everywhere. Manufactured products are used everywhere. Labour is used everywhere. As I say, this is a, a very simplified economy, but it's sufficient to demonstrate the effects. Now, let's put an extra couple of columns in which show final consumption. So, we have final physical consumption by consumers here. So that uh, final consumption 
the the labor figure doesn't make sense but um final physical consumption of uh, fuel is 38 million tons 10 10 billion loaves of bread 600,000 tons of flour for home baking 600,000 tons of grain in the form of barley etc that people use to make soup and we also have a table how much of each of these things was used productively which is done by summing along the rows there and we can now compute the values of all these products in person years per ton person years per loaf person years per ton etc if you want to put up a spreadsheet the computation in spreadsheet form is given there which what it means is that I'm computing corn use times the value of corn, fuel use times the value of fuel, manufacturers use times the value of manufacturers, plus labor divided by the output of flour. And that gives you the value per ton of the flour industry. If you're going to do this on a spreadsheet, you should use iterative solving, since, as I said earlier, a input output tables are a recursive structure and therefore you need your spreadsheet to work with recursive algorithms to give a solution to it if we now make random changes uh, uh, such as might be caused by weather alterations in technology illness etc you'll get a new table similar to the old one but with slight changes to all the cells it's not worth looking at the differences here but if you were to go from side to side you'd see that there are slight changes typically I have bounded the changes to be less than five percent we now look at what has happened to the output we have in green the industries for which more final consumption is available where production has gone up in red where production has gone down so 0.9 of the original amount of 0.982 of the original amount of food was available on the other hand quantity of fuel and manufacturers for final consumption has gone up now what does this mean for prices i'm making the most parsimonious assumption which i'll explain later of unit elasticity it means again in red some prices have gone down a price has gone up a price has stayed the same another price has gone down on the other hand if we look at the change in values which are computed purely from the conditions of production according to marx we see that most values have gone down. I've shown them in red because there's a decline. Most things have become easier to make. Now, if we compare the change, the, the price to the value, we see that in most cases, there are, or several cases, there are significant errors. The value's gone down here, but the price has gone down further. The value of this has gone down, and the price has uh, gone down much more. So there are errors in all of these. In, and in one case, the new price is too high, which is this. Um, this one. The price of final food is set too high higher than the actual value 
and these are obtained under the most parsimonious assumptions. That is to say, unit elasticity, constant returns to scale, random technical changes, but with a slight labor saving bias. What does unit elasticity use? It's not a Marxist idea. It's an idea used in neoliberal economics. And it says, if there's a one percent change in the quantity consumed, it goes along with a one percent change in price. So that if the quantity consumed drops by one percent, it goes up by one percent, the price drops by one percent. Constant returns to scale is what's assumed in Leontiev models, where it assumes a small percentage shift in an industry's output will have a corresponding increase in its inputs. If the industry output goes up by 1%, it'll have to use 1% more fuel, 1% more uh, corn, if you're making 1% more flour. This means that the Leontiev models of the economy are what's called linear models. And that's the simplest possible model you can make. But despite these simple assumptions, we see that the market prices either move the wrong way or move in an exaggerated way. Now, what we have here is an old story. It goes back to the 1960s when an economist at Cambridge University called Piero Sraffa published a book on the production of quantities by means of commodities. And this used a Leontiev-style linear model. Sraffa was the editor of the works of Ricardo and essentially was a modern Ricardian economist. So he's a modern classical economist, not a neoclassical. And he was able to show in what were called the Cambridge capital controversies that the basic assumptions of neoclassical economics fell down as soon as you started working with input-output tables. And that's because these, although they're linear, have a feedback structure. Whereas the class neoclassical economists and the Austrian economists like Mises and Hayek, either explicitly or implicitly, assume just a feed-forward flow of products from primary industry to secondary industry to final consumption. They don't deal with the interconnection between industries, which involves recursive loops. And this was something, the existence of these recursive loops only became apparent to people like um, Leontiev because they were approaching it from the standpoint of planning. So Hayek is wrong to say that prices will give the right signals. In a system with a matrix structure, with feedback loops, they will usually give the wrong answer. On the other hand, if you are carrying out economic planning with access to the input-output tables, that doesn't occur. As you saw, with a spreadsheet, provided you set it to recurse, you can readily compute the correct labor values. That means, in principle, the socialist planners could set correct prices in the market, the market prices which actually represent the amount of labour which is being required to make things. And the actual law value is predicated on the availability of labour to move between different branches of production. In a capitalist economy, this occurs noisily, with incorrect initial moves because the structure of price loses information. 
hence the chaotic, anarchic character of a system driven by price. On the other hand, with computerized planning, you can compute what would be the correct selling price for consumer goods measured in labor hours and what resource allocation is going to be needed to achieve this. And the economist who in the Soviet Union pioneered putting this on a mathematical foundation was Kantorovich. <laughs>